She had an unusual name and an improbable power, the power of the muse. I was obsessed, I truly was, and pretty much every song on the first and second album is about her. She was my muse. It wasn't like, you know, I was his groupie. He was more like my groupie. He was chasing me. Well, he was in love with her, and out of that love came fabulous music. She inspired him, and he perspired too. Any young man's muse is the girl he most wants to have sex with. <laughs> I think I made a pledge, if I ever meet this girl, Sharona, I'm gonna strangle her. All we ever did was hear that song. Hear that song. Now you only had to hear that once. You know, that riff started and uh, that's it. I'll never forget when I heard my Sharona for the very first time. And I just went, oh my God, this is a great song. It would come on the radio and we were just sort of blown away. It was like, wow, what is this? It was the beat. That song had the beat. I was a disc jockey. It got so many requests. The check marks next to the song were off the page and onto a second page. I could feel that music was changing. The guitar was going to be king again. We were a local LA band playing the Troubadour and the Starwood, and suddenly we were the biggest band in the world. By the dawn of the 80s, The Knack was not only one of the most successful bands in the world, but also one of the most critically scorned. Well, The Knack went from zero to 90 and, uh, and basically became a car wreck very, very quickly. And I think it had a lot to do with the media. We went from like, you got to hear The Knack to get the fuck out of here, Knack. The thing that got me most angry, when I read reviews, they don't even mention the performance of the band. And they overlooked us and just put us in the superficial Beatle category really pissed me off. We had the strangest career ever. I don't know that anybody else could learn from what happened to us. But before a towering cloud of disorder and discontent would ultimately destroy the band, the Knack ruled the music world. Rocketing to the top of the charts and selling over six million copies of their debut album, Get the Knack. I'm Doug Spiger. Doug played his role perfectly. Fantastic deliverer of the songs, and he played that rhythm guitar to perfection. Doug Feiger knew he was a superstar. He was a star. We're going to go play some now, but I'd like to introduce you to the band. Bert Nevere on lead guitar. They had Bert. Bert Nevere had to be one of the best and most unusual pop guitarists around at that time. He wasn't just a good player, he had his own style. Our drummer is Bruce Gary. Bruce Gary was very well respected in the business as one of the best drummers. I would imagine that anybody from other bands who saw us would, would say, for instance, about Bruce, going, fuck, oh, man, that guy's amazing. Well, Bruce is one of the great drummers in the history of rock. That's why he was the only drummer for the next. That's Prescott Niles, plays bass. This wasn't just a bass player. Prescott was always, like, right there. Didn't matter what Bruce was doing, Prescott was there. He and I developed a real kinship, and I think he's one of the finest players. He's an incredibly melodic bass player. He's probably the bastard child of, you know, I don't know, Paul McCartney and Sid Vicious. You know, has that rock thing. I'll check you out later. We're gonna, we're gonna go play. They weren't just any old band. I mean, this was an awesome rock and roll band. There's a certain knowingness behind Doug's kind of facade. He grew up in Detroit, he understands like that's the home of the Stooges, the MC5, and there's a knowingness behind what he's doing. He was a smart kid. It wasn't like he was just some like rowdy rock and roll. He came from a very sort of 
square family, you know, they all did. They, these weren't like your regular rock and roll kids. We grew up as young boys in 60s America with weirdos and Big Daddy Roth and Mad Magazine. Also the hipsters and the beatniks and the beat poets and all of that stuff. You know, we were hip little kids. Those moments that I listened to pop music in my room and transported me to some other place, they took me out of my gray, lonely life in Detroit when I was a kid. As teenagers transfixed by the British invasion, Doug Figer and his musical ally, John Corey, formed a band called Sky, a local Detroit sensation opening for the likes of The Who and Traffic. The band were soon signed to RCA Records and relocated to Los Angeles. We were very young. Our manager was pretty crazy and he terrorized us. And the other guys really couldn't take it. That band split up and they moved back to Detroit and I wasn't about to leave Los Angeles and go back to a winter in Detroit. So I stayed out here and uh, uh, I'm glad that I did because the first musician that I met was a drummer named Bruce Garrett. Before I played with the Knack, I had a long string of other things that I was involved with, starting with Albert Collins when I was 15 years old. And that led into playing with Arthur Lee in Love, uh, Albert King, John Lee Hooker, Jack Bruce. I wanted to be the Buddy Rich of rock and roll. People like Keith Moon and Ginger Baker really impressed and, and influenced my way of thinking about drumming, and that is to learn how to overplay tastefully. I was doing a lot of session work at Capitol Records in 1971 or two. One of the in-house producers called me up and said there was this guy who came from Detroit who wanted to make some demos. I came down and did some tracks with him. I lived in Hollywood at the time and Bruce lived with his parents out in Woodland Hills. And I would drive out and rehearse with him in his bedroom. It would just be me on bass and him on drums. And I always put it in the back of my mind, you know, someday I'm going to have a band with this guy. My first impression was that he was a really fine pop tunesmith. He had a good idea about the formula of pop music. So I was impressed with his songwriting abilities. So we did the session and uh, I didn't hear from him for a while. It became like I'd hear from him every nine or ten months or whatever, or even a year or two would go by and then I'd get a call to do the same kind of thing. I got a call one day in uh, spring of 73 from a guy named Rob Carmichael who wanted me to come and audition for his band and there was this guitar player who looked like a hippie Huck Finn. Started playing, we're having a heat wave, a tropical heat wave, and just went off. My hair stood up and I pulled him aside and said, you know, like, what are you doing in this band? And he pulled back, he looked at me and said, well, what are you doing in this band? And I knew I'd found my partner. His music was always something I took to very naturally and very early. By the time the Beatles happened in 64, I was already a huge music fan and it meant a lot to me. When I was 11 years old, I taught myself how to play guitar. When he took up the guitar, he'd be in the bedroom and kids would come out of the bedroom shaking their heads and in disbelief. They couldn't believe that was coming out of him. I had the talent gene and I didn't have the ambition gene. You know, that's why I'm very lucky to have met up with Doug, because Doug had enough ambition for 10 people. A lot of weed burning. That's what, it's, what it smelled like when you were around Burton back then. I think four generations of my family got stoned just from me taking one hit of one of the joints that he used to smoke constantly. We bonded doing that. We'd go to Huntington Library and hang out in the gardens and you know, we'd talk music and we were always, you know, sort of throwing things back and forth and, and we started writing together. What Burton and Doug had was communication between each other. They plugged into each other as writers, and their songwriting ability was, uh, was quite unique. When we were writing together in those early days, it was like we didn't question it. We were just doing what we were doing. But a lot of stuff would come out. I think they were working as a team. I think there was no self-importance attached to who wrote what. So I really think they were at their best only because they really needed each other. Doug gave me a call and said that he was working with this great guitarist he found from the valleys. Burton grew up in the same area I did in the San Fernando Valley. I called Bruce and Burton and said, let's put some songs down on tape really professionally. Maybe that's what it'll take. We'll make masters. I 
borrowed some money from a friend of my father's and we went into a small studio and did six songs. Two of which were Good Girls Don't and That's What the Little Girls Do. That's what the little girls do to you, to you. We were turned down by every label in Los Angeles, every label in New York, and every label in London. Uh, we were turned down by Capitol four different times. <laughs> Same guys who later signed us, too. I got another call from the Musicians Contact Service of a band called The Rats. I recorded this album called The Sunset Bombers with these guys, again, being paid, not really being a member of the band. Brewing across the Atlantic, a new musical phenomenon was exploding, punk rock. The drummer for the band, Brandon, he came by, knocked on the door, and he, he had this single and he said, Doug, look at it, touch it, smell it, this is the real deal. And he put on uh, Anarchy in the UK, the single, and my mind was blown. And I realized that the time was coming when the kind of music that I loved was going to come back into vogue. Sex Pistols is one of my favorite bands of all time. Really great band. I don't think that uh, the Nat could have happened really if it wasn't for the Pistols. They opened a lot of doors for a lot of people. I think if it hadn't been for the Sex Pistols, the Nat might not have happened. They showed that you could go out and play hard rock and roll, and it mattered, that it was relevant. And Doug was completely over the top about Johnny Rotten. He, was, he wanted to be Johnny Rotten. Johnny Rotten was the thing, and also the, the look, the vests and the white shirt and the black pants, he had worn, I'd seen a picture of him wearing that. We hadn't made much headway in shopping tapes. People were beginning to get some notice playing around town. I just said to Bruce and Burton, look, at, now that we've done this, let's, let's put a band together and go out and play. Because if that doesn't happen, I, you know, I gotta start thinking about doing something else. There were the three of us, and Doug wanted to be able to play rhythm guitar instead of bass when we performed live, because that would be easier when he was singing. And that's why we added a bass player as opposed to a rhythm guitarist, and that would be Prescott, uh, whom Bruce knew. So basically, Bruce had called me, uh, I guess, in April of 78, and mentioned he was in a great band, and I'd be perfect. I had the Paul McCartney vibe, and you know, I could play great, great lines. So I figured it would be a great chance to play with Bruce. The band didn't become the band until Prescott joined the band. Prescott has a, a unique style and a unique personality, and without him, it isn't the Nat. I just remember hearing stuff in the radio, and uh, my mom was musical to the degree she used to actually bring home some cool stuff. I think once the uh, Beatles made their appearance in America, that was it. That kind of started me on really pursuing, really seriously playing. Prescott's a great bass player and he's very active. The bass player in bands often gets overlooked because he's kind of like the blocking back, you know, but in a band like the Knack where playing ability was encouraged, whoever was interested in looking at the bass player would come away going, man, they got a really great bass player. As I was learning the songs, I realized that, you know, this wasn't just an ordinary gig. I really felt that the songs were good, the band had a great chemistry, and, you know, this could be some. <laughs> It's amazing that at the beginning of the band, how many songs came in such a short time. It clicked, totally. The hard way. Remember your names? Tara, end of the game, Lucinda, Heartbeat. Everybody got that? Doug had an aggressive quality about him, and I believe it was needed in those early days. I think that he was a driving force, and I think he was very hungry, because he had been rejected. He understood how to create a formula. Very good at direction and coming with ideas himself. They believed they were stars before they even got into the studio and cut anything, and it was Doug's hyping them that did that, you see. Doug convinced them all that he was the next great thing, and that they were going to be a part of this. I always felt that it was going to happen from the get-go. We were called 2020 at the time, and I sent Bomp Magazine a picture and a demo tape 
And I think two issues later, we, we got the magazine and it said 2020 on the cover. And I'm thinking, wow, we're in the magazine. And I open it up and there's a picture of three guys and it's not us. So I pulled out a dictionary and uh, started with the A's. I was on the phone with Burton, literally just saying every word. When we got to the K's, I said, the knack. It was good because it was one syllable, it was singular, and it actually meant something, having a, having a kind of peculiar ability to pull something off. Doug wanted to have a specific look, and the black and the white went with the stripped down aspect. I mean, we always had said no colored lights on stage either, just, just a white light, because um, I think maybe either subconsciously or consciously, we were throwing ourselves back to when we were kids and you're watching, you know, the Beatles and the Stones on black and white TV. So as long as Doug didn't ask me to wear a pink tutu, I was fine. And I didn't mind the look. It was a good look. I think it gave the band an identity. I gave myself an identity as part of the band. I was 25. I'd been in a relationship for 10 years and been totally faithful. The girl that I'd been living with for 10 years was uh, named Judy Halpert, and she introduced me to Sharona. She had told me about this little girl who worked across the street from her with an odd name. I was introduced to Doug by his girlfriend at the time. I was working at a clothing store. She introduced us, and when he met me, he was shaking a little bit. It was instant. There was this electric thing that happened, and I, it was like getting hit with a baseball bat. He took me to lunch and he said, I'm completely in love with you and I'm leaving this relationship that I've been in for nine years. And I was like, really? Uh, I'm, I'm so flattered, but I'm in love with my boyfriend right now. She was cute. She had a boyfriend. Doug had a girlfriend. And the reality was she was not breaking up with her boyfriend yet. Oftentimes, a creative artists best songwriting moments come from when they're hungry or horny or just generally feeling unloved or any combination of the three and, and that was probably the case with Doug. Somebody has described Get the Knack as a concept album about teenage lust. What does a 14 year old boy want? He wants a 14 year old girl. Their image was mischievous boys I wanted to know more about them. Doug writes these songs that are not quite love songs, they're more lust songs. I think I can project that he was a horny bastard and it had that sort of very sexual, very sort of uh, dirty edge which seemed to go very well with the Sunset Strip. The Knack was launched in the clubs around LA's bustling playground of music and decadence, the Sunset Strip. The strip was just alive. I mean, there were lines around the block for shows. I think it was inspired by the whole punk movement. You know, that inspired everybody around the world. They formed bands and just started playing all these clubs. It was a new energy. People just kind of gravitated towards each other, other that had been tired of all the arena rock and the heavy metal and like thought, well, I, I don't even want to play like that if I could. I want to do something different. The punk thing and the new wave thing was pushing people to this raw, stripped down thing. And that kind of energy described our band. June 1st, we played our first gig at the Whiskey A Go Go. The whiskey, the whiskey, and the whiskey was a Tijuana bathroom with red leather. It was also heaven on earth. The whiskey show was good. And I think it kind of validated the reality that A, we had to be a four-piece, and B, we really had some. The Troubadour was really the big, big, big first show, because then there was expectations. This time there was a word on the street that we were really something else. Starting September, October of 78, it really started popping here. Uh, the Knack was one of those early groups which we played here all oh, starting about June um, of 78. And they played here about 19 or 20 times, very consistently. He loved the Knack. He thought it was a great band and he saw we were bringing in business. 
So they became the perfect home for us. Every now and then they played out of town, but wherever they played out of town, and then they came to the Troubadour the following week, there was a line, and then next week there was a longer line. We were packing the clubs. It was a phenomenon. It wasn't something we could engineer. When we were started bringing in large amounts of people to these gigs we were playing in all the local clubs in the area, club owners, were, were their eyebrows went up a little bit. Oh, okay, this, there's something to this. We can make some money. Well, let's start booking more rock and roll in the clubs. I think the scene was changed by our example. I was aware of them, as everybody else in L.A. was, because, uh, you know, there were lines of kids around the block to go see them at their shows. The burgeoning of our following was a real organic thing. It was really a uh, classic word of mouth. People would come away and say, man, I had the best time the other night. And they were super exciting, and I just walked out of there going, I want to play stuff that does that that makes me feel that way. We excelled at what we did at that point because it was, we were doing it for the love of it, which I think was the main reason. And we enjoyed playing rock and roll in front of lots of screaming fans. There was this group of girls in Fairfax High and they were early big fans of our band. It just seems to me maybe from the first gig. I was one of them and we were truly friends of the band. You know, just always integral to the Knack. We'd go out every weekend, and even during the week, whenever the Knack was playing, we'd go see them, every single gig that they did. People always thought that we were groupies, which was completely untrue. They were really, really close friends of ours, and we were a support system. And we would bring all our friends to see them, and we just started spreading the word. There was a big buzz around town going on about them. They had their own little fan base and all the kids were talking about them. And Crowds, and they knew every word to every song. I went to the Starwood and saw the Knack. I'm like, this is fantastic. And they were rock, they were tight, you know, they were really tight. The record companies didn't come around until you know, many, many, many months later. We played about 150 shows or about a year and a couple months before we went in to cut the first album. Celebrities started to get up and jam with us. First one to do it was Ray Manzarek from The Doors. And then Eddie Money jammed with us a couple times. I remember playing Two Tickets to Paradise with him. Yeah, Tom Petty got up with us. Everybody had fun. Stephen Stills got up and jammed with us. And one night in November, I believe it was, Bruce Springsteen got up and jammed with us. At the time, Bruce Springsteen was very, very big. And I knew Bruce. I'd met Bruce years earlier. There was one day I, I said, Bruce, we're playing at the Troubadour tonight. We please come down and see us? And then you might even feel like playing with us. We're playing, and in the middle of the show, I look out into the audience, and I see Bruce coming through, sitting down at his table. Doug went out and said, I don't know if he wants to play or not, but they call him the boss. He came up and played uh, a Bo Diddley medley with us, Not Fade Away and uh, Mona, and it was just phenomenal. Bruce Springsteen gets up on stage with us on a Friday night, and on Monday, we have 14 record offers. I was sold the first time that I saw them. Although, as it turns out, 15 labels wanted to sign them, so I wasn't exactly unique in that particular way. We wanted people who really cared about us. And there's a guy named Bruce Ravid, and he was one of their A&R guys. And from early on in the band, he came to see us, and he just loved the band. One thing that Capitol did differently than the other labels is that we got the Capitol Tower involved from top to bottom, and I mean that literally and figuratively. We had all kinds of people from all different departments. We had a, a regular army. When I first saw them, I loved them. I thought they were absolutely fucking great. The excitement on stage that they put across was unbelievable. I realized then we wanted to sign them. When it was announced that we had signed the Knack, we wanted to trumpet this to the world. We decided to do this rooftop signing filmed with helicopters the whole shebang. This is actually the signing. Now check it out. Look at the president, Don Zimmerman. Look at his hair. That's the most amazing thing that a president of a record company would have. It was special. 
and they wanted something special. They didn't just want to sign a contract. They wanted to sign a contract and do something special and have this moment and it was magic. It was magic. Mike Chapman was a big contribution, you know, to those guys. I totally acknowledge him as being like, you know, a real happening producer for bands at that time. They said we want it to sound like a performance, like a, a show. What we had to do was make the record quickly because to labor over it would have taken that spontaneity out of it. The album took 11 days to record and two days to mix. I don't think we did more than two takes on any song except for maybe tonight. So basically we just went and recorded what we did live that worked. I think all the songs were there. That's why the album cost seventeen and a half thousand dollars. It'd be one or two takes. We'd just play the song like we were playing it live. They had to see me as the audience and they were performing for me and they knew I wanted them to give me their very best performances and they did. Okay, that sounded pretty good. Why don't you come in and take a listen? Okay. So the first thing they played me was my Sharona. And they just stood there and bang, there it was, it, sounding exactly the way it ended up sounding. And, and I said to them, uh, whoa, that's, uh, that's pretty heavy duty. Um, and they looked, they said, do you like it? I said, well, I, it's, it's a monster, isn't it? And they said, you think so? And I said, I would say that's probably a number one song. There are songs that I like to describe as their hits before the band comes in. And when I brought it into a rehearsal, I knew I liked it a lot. And instead of going right to Doug with it and saying, let's write a song, I mentioned in general terms how I imagined the beat to Bruce, and he took it from there. I used to play in a surf band, and we used to do these things called flams, which is basically hitting the sticks not exactly at the same time. It's got to be a staggered thing. So to add to... I thought I'd do something with the flams where I wouldn't... I was sort of getting this idea in my head about stuttering, in the stuttering idea, because, you know, I wanted it to be a really teenage song. My generation and the mum 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 my, you know, that idea. And then, of course, I had fallen in love with this girl, and I was desperately trying to impress her. And I said, hey, Bertie, let's go back to my apartment and let's, let's finish writing this so we can bring it in for rehearsal tomorrow. So we went back to, to the apartment that I was sharing with my girlfriend, Judy. I started riffing on the idea of my, 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 my Sharona. And when I came out with that, Burton stopped and said, you can't do that. His girlfriend at the time was in the other room. I went, man, Judy's right there. She's in the other room, stop, Doug, she'll hear you. I said, it's, it's, it's okay. I just feel it. I haven't seen this in over 25 years. When you gonna give me some time. This is my Sharona, us recording my Sharona. <laughs> wow. It takes you where you don't expect to go. It goes musical, real musical, you know? It's a double, you know, treat. It has a bit of depth. It has a, a lot of sexual energy, my Sharona. And I think the best songs do, and I think that also holds it up. I had this idea of it being sort of a metaphor for sex, for the sex that I wanted desperately to have with Sharona. And then there would be this climax and this euphoria, this euphoric lead guitar solo. When it came time to record it, Doug just, I remember he goes, just burn. But it was cool because I just realized he was just saying, just, just let go. I thought it was really ingenious of him to come up with that kind of solo for a song like that.
sometimes on lunch breaks we'd run, I'd run to SIR and just hear the band for an hour and I heard Burton say to Doug something like, should we play it? Uh, yeah, let's play it for her, you know, let's play it for her. And all of a sudden these four guys just played this big song. Did I just hear a song with my name in it? Like, was my name in that song that I just heard? I think my name, it sounded like my name was just in the song that I just heard. I remember having the album, and I used to listen to it at home in England, but I couldn't really tell people because it was kind of uncool, being from the Sex Pistols and that whole era. I loved that album. It was a very powerful record. What I loved is there was a, a variety. I dare you to find a record with a more a more lethal opening salvo than the first three, four songs. Let Me Out just goes, you know, you know, they, they open the gate and they're ready to go. Let Me Out was obviously always the, the lead-off track. We needed a strong opener, so Doug and Burton wrote a great, strong opening song. The words helped that, too, let me out. You know, we wanted to let out. And so it was like the perfect synthesis for an opening song. It explodes. You know, the bass playing, the drumming, everything about it, the guitar lead is just great. To me, that was our, my generation. All of a sudden, we're out of the box. Let me out. We're out. Absurdly fast. Years after, when we were getting back together, Doug and I were considering songs for our set, and we put on uh, Get the Knack, and we both looked at each other at the same time and said, is that playing fast? When we wrote Your Number Your Name, it was like a Holly song. But when you got that like cannonading tom noms going on in the background, it just ended up being another song where we were jumping and, and slamming and thrusting. Perfect second song, love the guitar hook, Doug wrote a great melody with Burton. Oterra is a true story. I was playing in uh, the Sunset Bombers, and we opened for a band called Skayfish, and his roadie was a beautiful, when I said beautiful, I mean beautiful girl. She used to love these big amps and stuff, named Tara. No, Tara's like, it's that sort of classic young guy thing of like, you have these like real emotional things, but you don't know how to express them. You know, you're a guy, no one teaches you that kind of stuff. Uh, and so it's a beautifully innocent song with one of the most awesome guitar solos I've ever heard. I think Oterra was uh, very Beatlesque. I think it, it was uh, very commercial. Um, I never quite did know who this person was that he'd written about. Sharona was always around, so I think talking about whoever Terra was was not the thing to do in front of Sharona. Apart from uh, My Sharona, She's So Selfish was my absolute favorite song on the record. Selfish was written by Doug, and it was kind of a teasing, playful look, I believe, at Sharona. He was writing most of his songs about Sharona at that time. And I brought in the release. When she gets you by the short hair, it's the only thing she'll leave you down there. And all the dirty words. Capital wanted to release She's So Selfish, editing the lyrics. So I think Doug felt, at least he told me, that he'd be selling out if they changed the lyrics and selfish. We never had any problem using dirty words in songs because it was 1979, for God's sake, that's where the way kids talked. 
it wasn't a shocking thing to hear a kid say fuck. A 17 year old says fuck all the time. Sweet I actually, I always like good girls, don't I like the dirty girl, you know, impression. I thought that was cleverly put. Recorded it for the first time in 1972 and had made at least four demos of it, been turned down by everybody. I was sick of the song, I didn't really want to record it, and Mike was very high on the song. He said, look at Doug, we'll go out there, You'll play it one time, you'll sing live. If we don't get it in one take, we won't put it on the album. And of course, we got it in one take, and that's the take that's on the album. She's your adolescent brain, schoolboy stuff, a sticky sweet romance. I wrote the song basically with Johnny Cash's voice in, in mind. Stuff, a sticky sweet romance. It's a real story about him. You know, some girl once said to him, good girls don't, but I do, and what a great thing for a kid to hear a girl say. I love the song. Uh, I, I really thought that the, the lyric was going to be its downfall. I didn't think there was any way that we were going to get away with that lyric. I was quite surprised when it was, ended up being the second single. The radio stations were saying, we want to play Good Girls Don't, but we can't play those songs the way they're on the album. We cut that alternate lyric when we did it because we all knew that, you know, if this was ever going to make the radio waves, it wasn't going to make even uh, FM radio in those days with that lyric. I always appreciate, uh, you know, a little bit of subversive stuff. When you're at that age, that's what music's about, rock and roll's about. Good girls do, by the way. Frustrated is a good rocker, kind of Stones vibe in a way, you know, hard rocking song. I think that song is very catchy, it's a big crowd favorite. I, you. Oh, oh, I, you. I think the lyrics are great, because it really was expressing what Doug was feeling at the time. He was frustrated. It was about Sharona. kept me at arm's distance, you know, she enjoyed the attention, I think, but she wasn't giving me any. <laughs> I've literally played the album a million times. I still have a copy of it. Decades after its release, the front cover of Get the Knack remains the most recognizable image of the band. That was one of the very first pictures taken of the band. It was very early in our clubbing career. We needed a picture for posters to be nailed up on the local, you know, uh, telephone poles. I wasn't personally crazy about the cover. I don't like my picture on the cover. <laughs> my dentist likes the picture on the cover. Flash the cover. Doug had this, like, incredible shit-eating grin in, in, like, the main photo that you saw everywhere. It's like this leering grin. I guess you could sort of take it the wrong way, and I think people did sometimes, but it looks kind of endearing, sort of like, sort of like he sort of knew something that somebody else didn't. What I was hearing about the Knack was that they were the next Beatles. 
and uh, I was very interested. And the whole thing was to recall the Beatles, and I think they did it very effectively. You know, the whole back cover shot of the album with the, the studio shot was very, very reminiscent of, of all the Beatles stuff that we'd seen of them playing live. The back cover of the album was an in-joke. It was like, what's the next big thing going to be? Well, it's going to be just like the last big thing, kids. They were marketed as the next Beatles. Anytime anybody tries to do that, it's a kiss of death, you know. In retrospect, it's just laughable that people actually thought we were trying to be the next Beatles in any way, shape, or form. There's no easier way to make yourself hated than to try to do something like that. It was tongue-in-cheek. It wasn't meant to be taken seriously. Nobody in their right minds could really be the second coming of the Beatles. It worked for them. I couldn't have imagined them in like Van Halen clothes, you know, that would have been really silly. Uh, so the image really worked. It's funny, it's more like people look at the pictures but they didn't listen to the tunes. I mean, musically the Knack are very much in the league of the early Kinks or the early Who, just sort of that aggressive power pop with an edge and a little nastiness. The next thing I know, there's a billboard on Hollywood Boulevard and it's like black and white and it's very Beatles sort of, you know, type concept. And it's not the Beatles, it's Get the Knack. Well, it was a year to the day after we played our first gig at the Whiskey A Go Go. We were in Europe, actually in Liverpool the day it was released. We begged Capital not to release anything, to let radio pick our single. We started getting these reports from the states that they were playing My Sharona on the radio like crazy. Capital did not pick it as the first single. They did not know what the single was going to be. My Sharona was unquestionably the most requested song. It was a no-brainer. Radio chose it really and the public went berserk. I remember buying shoes once and in the background My Sharona. Some fella came by on a bicycle in front of my house and he had a little one of those little radios attached to the handlebars. My Sharona. Con todos los amigos en el póster de aplauso. Con vosotros, de NAC. All of our companies around the world were all turned on to and excited about the NAC. Went number one in Israel, went number one in every single, went number one in Latvia. The Get the NAC album became the fastest selling new album from a new band since the Beatles. We were number one album, number one single, number one FM airplay, and number one retail. It was like a team winning a game, you know. Of all the records that had ever been made that week, more of them decided to buy our record than any other record. It was like that for five weeks, and then Led Zeppelin knocked us off. If it hadn't have been for Led Zeppelin, we probably would have stayed number one. When a band suddenly breaks that big, that quickly, it, it tends to look like it's masterminded and it's a big corporate kind of thing. It's funny, people have accused the Knack of being this big hype and that the record company hyped the band. I was told at the time by Capitol Records that they spent $50,000 promoting Get the Knack, total. The Knack didn't capitalize on a movement, they created a movement. The whole record industry descended on L.A. after they released Get the Knack to find other bands that would be the next Knack. I remember you know, going through the clubs and, and hearing the call, hey, this is, they, they think, think the band's going to be the next Knack, you know, and like it was, you hear it every freaking weekend. Capital was buzzing, and it, they were buzzing about the Knack. That was it. The Knack was it. I left Capitol Records over that. I had Highway Man, the album, and the guy said, I don't know, he said, you got to change, he said, music is changing. I said, I said, yeah, I know, that's why I'm going to do Highway Man. You do good stuff, then good stuff will happen. You know, I don't want to follow no Mascherona. That's what he wanted me to do, be, do something like the Knack, you know. We've got number one album, number one single, number one retail, number one FM airplay. I'm sitting in the kitchen on the counter, and I'm expecting to hear, ta-da, you know, the trumpets go off, and there were no trumpets. And I felt exactly the same way I had felt pretty much all my life, which was I didn't really belong, my skin didn't really fit. I expected success to close up that hole, and it isn't that way. The way that I dealt 
with the fact that it didn't fix it was to just start drinking. He wants to order some water. I like a white wine. My father had died uh, tragically, he was 60 years old. And my mom in that period of time was just in a bad, bad way. You know, she had been married over 35 years. It was a wonderful marriage and, and the only man she had ever known. And she was despondent, there's no, no doubt about it. And coming to see her son in a band was something that got her out of the house. It's not being dramatic to say it gave her something to live for. So that was, in many ways, in, in kind of human equation level, that was the greatest thing about the band. It was a very, very low point in my life. And this just picked me up, and it added a new dimension to my life. It really did, and stayed with me. She was at every single show. It wouldn't have been a normal knack show if she wasn't there. After finishing a globe-trotting tour of England, Australia, and Japan, the band took a well-deserved break in the Hawaiian Islands before launching a U.S. tour. It was in this tropical paradise that Doug and Sharona's romance blossomed. I had invited her to come to a show in Hawaii. And her boyfriend found out that she was going to go to see us in Hawaii, and he wasn't coming. And, and he broke up with her. I was in love with the person I was in a relationship with before I met Doug. I wasn't prepared to break up. There were times where I was in my boyfriend's arms at a show, listening to Doug, staring into my eyes, singing my Sharona. Imagine what it was like to have a man not give up. Sharona met him at the airport, and I didn't see Doug for four days. We did a show, but that was it. From that moment on until we broke up three years later, we were pretty much inseparable. Every day, every night, every place. Every night, a new town, a new big city, and they were excited. They weren't just coming to see a show, they were excited. The reward, the award, comes from the audience. It comes from, from getting people that stand on their feet and jump up and down and get girls to scream. They buy your records. I mean, that's the award. Excuse me, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? No, no, the answer is practice. The crowning glory of the NAC sold-out U.S. tour was their headlining appearance at New York's legendary Carnegie Hall. It was Carnegie Hall. <laughs> it was Carnegie Hall. My God, you know, we want to play Carnegie Hall. There were thousands of kids, like, camped out in front of Carnegie Hall. They sold the tickets out in, like, 17 minutes or something, and there were cops on horses everywhere. It was like a riot. I flew my parents in to see us, which was fun. That was a great moment. Because my parents really never understood why I did what I did. They, I left home at a very young age. And this was kind of a nice turning point to show my parents and get some pride out of them. Yeah, I mean, you see my mom and dad there, the, the pride and, and, and all that. And especially to have New York be such a big uh, push for us. I mean, they had a big billboard in Times Square. That was extraordinary. So more than any other city, because I grew up there, that was, that was something else. We would hear fans leaving the show, screaming and yelling and laughing. We were pleasing thousands of people. We were getting them off. We were rocking their world. Everything was going great. My Sharona was huge. The album was huge. They were really the hottest band there could be. And then we started hearing that people were angry. And it mostly came from the press. They became so big so quickly, that automatically causes resentment. And another thing was the next interview policy. We made a major mistake. Our management, and we went along with it, felt that it was better showbiz not to do any interviews, not to let people know who you were. I was told that we were hearkening back to a time when people weren't so damn pretentious that they'd presume you want to hear us pontificate because we have one hit record. I think the real reason why we're giving interviews is uh, we got in trouble. Uh, we take a lot of flack in the press about some things, you know, and uh, I don't really care as long as they spell my name, my name on the day. 
In the early days, the critics loved The Knack. After the first album was released, though, uh, those same critics that loved The Knack in the beginning started to turn on him. How could it have changed so much that it was, we were the glorious, the wonderful Knack, one minute, and we were this horrible, sellout, commercial, bullshit, hype, the next minute? It made me angry. I think Doug dug his own grave with the critics. He fed off it, you know. He, he, it didn't bother him because he just had this belief in himself. He was the greatest. So when the critics pulled him apart, he, um, he said, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. And he became more arrogant. It's a little warm in here right now. Yeah. Is it hot in here or is it just my career? He withdrew. That was the starting point of withdrawing. He kind of built his own little world at the time based on his own opinions of, or perceptions of radio and critics and other, and I think it became too intellectual. I just think that was the starting of the alienation, which, which continued on the second album. Just became so big, and I think that they handled the success all in different ways, but ultimately not great. They didn't handle it great. I think there were a lot of mistakes made with the knack and, uh, that's their legacy, you know, the band that made all the mistakes. Big mistake. American Bandstand. It was a consensus that it wasn't hip by, uh, by the people in power. When I see Dick Clark looking back on American Bandstands of the past, and I realize and I see that we're not there, it really hurts me. Bob Hope wanted us to do the uh, uh, Christmas special, The Great Wall of China. I believe it was going to be shot, and it was turned down. I was told we turned down Saturday Night Live because we, they were told we would do it if we hosted. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> the manager at the time, I'll excuse him for his innocence and his non-expertise and being way over his head. I will say that. However, the decisions killed us. Our manager, in his infinite wisdom, felt that uh, it was more important for us to be out on tour in uh, bumfuck Egypt than it was to do the uh, Grammy show where there was uh, 30 million people watching it. There was no attention given to that. It's like, okay, we we're gonna go back to Japan because we can probably clean up again. Maybe that was the attitude. We were nominated for two Grammys. I would have loved to have attended the Grammys during my nomination. So in hindsight, that seems like a totally foolish thing. A terrible move and a move that we had no idea was going on while we were out on tour. I knew at that moment, I, would, I said, you know, we've blown too many great opportunities. We should have been at the Grammys. If we played My Sharona at the Grammys, we would have sold another two million albums. People were too damn picky about what we did do, and as a result, we pissed a lot of people off. Something about this band exploding that big and seeming to take it only half seriously rub people the wrong way. There was this backlash, which obviously being in LA, you know, you kind of sense, which included the Nuke the Knack campaign. They were so overhyped. I continued to hear more and more stuff about it. And it was like, you know, I'll do something that's kind of obnoxious and kind of funny. And that's what started. Then it just snowballed. We had a sticker, which was cheap and easy to do. We had the Nuke the Knack button. Here's the uh, Nuke the Neck t-shirt. It came in a uh, your own Nuke the Neck sack. I first heard that there was a guy at a local record swap meet selling t-shirts and buttons that said Nuke the Neck. And so Bruce Prescott and I went to the Capitol record swap meet and actually bought them. It was interesting when the band came up and at the swap meeting all wanted to, to buy them and they had a photographer with them to cover it, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, he said something to me about Sharona and, uh, and I said, you leave Sharona out of this. And the next week at the swap meet he was selling bumper stickers that said honk if you slept with Sharona. And that's when I called the lawyers. Critics had plastered a bullseye on the neck, but sometimes the firing squad was a little friendlier. Ooh, my little hungry one, hungry one, open up a package of my bologna. This guy comes up to me and says, hey, my name's Al, and I want you to listen to this cassette. And he handed it to me, and we play the song, and it was my bologna. 
so when I finally actually, actually got to see the, the Knack live in concert at Cal Poly, I, I got to weasel my way back backstage and meet the guys, and they were all excited to meet me. Oh, it's the My Bologna guy, you know? Ooh, my little hungry one, hungry one, open up a package of My Bologna. Rupert Perry happened to be there backstage as well, and Doug Figer introduced me to him, and he goes, oh yeah, Yankovic, Yankovic, we gotta put this My Bologna thing out on Capitol Records. And I'm like thinking, yeah, you should, you know. I was this, you know, senior uh, student getting a major in architecture, and, you know, I didn't really want to be an architect, and I thought, I'll be on Capitol Records, sure. I believe that we have to hold the record for the most parody versions of the same song, because off the top of my head, there was My Bologna, Ayatollah, Slide Trombona, Nine Coronas, Juan Corona, my scrotum from Cheech and Chong. My scrotum. So that right there, that's six different parodies of the same song. And so I think we hold the record. And Weird Al started it all. In February of 1980, only eight months after the release of Get the Knack, came the band's second album, But the Little Girls Understand. By the time we recorded the second album, Things had really changed. That was as a result, I think, of a, of a losing perspective and objectivity. There are some blank spots in my brain about this record uh, for a very good reason. Some of these songs were recorded under such stress and duress. You tend to sort of block them out. There was some particularly dark moments during the making of that second record. Mike Chapman, uh, because of his uh, in indiscretions at the time, was going through a serious divorce problem with his wife. And Mike was having a nervous breakdown. So I just think if you look at all the signs, it was not the time to start the second album. The second album was actually part two of the first album. We'd wanted to do a double album. When we cut the second album, we were uh, very, we really wanted to do what we did at the time. And we realized now it was a mistake to try and recreate something that we did maybe on the first album. But it was six months after we cut the first album. We, were, we didn't need to be in a hurry, and yet we were, we were caught up in this excitement. There was a sort of spirit within them that they, they conquered the world, and they were going to conquer the world again. And nothing was going to stop them. And they felt they had the songs and they had the material. The first and second albums were all written at the same time. They were meant to be a double album. Capital at the time, though, said, you're a brand new band. You've never had an album out. We'll be lucky if we sell 50,000 copies. So we had to cut the album basically in two, and we didn't want to lose the songs for that, which is why the second album came out so quickly after the first. But it followed on too quickly from the first. It needed to be a break, give their audience a break, give the critics a break from this you know, this barrage of knackism that had gone on. And uh, that's not what happened. From my opinion, it was a mistake to rush into recording the second album. We should have coasted. The first album was so successful that there would have been nothing wrong with spending a year getting the second album together. Well, to say I didn't have much of a say in the doings of the band would be putting it very mildly. So My first thought was when Doug said, well, I want to go in and record a second album because we're so hot right now and we should jump on this train. I thought, why are we doing this so soon? Don Zimmerman did say, and he was the president of Capitol Records at the time, and I remember him saying it. He said, you're coming too soon. This is where I needed a good manager. I needed a manager to say to me, Doug, he's the president of our record company. He's telling us we're coming too soon. Maybe we should listen to him. I think things got in the way health-wise for the knack, you know, like a lot of us were all going through that. I'm talking cocaine and all that kind of shit, man. It, you're not really writing stuff. It's a numbing agent, man. I remember one night me running into Doug Figer and saying, hey, you know, hi, you're in the knack. And he's like, yeah, hey, you're in the Devo and uh, you want to do some cocaine? <laughs> cocaine was big in those days, and I think Doug discovered it. He certainly didn't need cocaine. I mean, he was going up 2,000 miles an hour anyway. And uh, that stuff really makes you nasty, you know. Uh, it does dreadful things to people. We had money. We had money for the first time. And we finally had money for drugs. Everyone was getting richer. Everyone probably had their indulgences. I didn't necessarily socialize with anyone's but Doug's. So Doug's 
indulged in drugs and he could afford to. I liked alcohol, I liked cocaine, I liked quaaludes. I just liked anything that would make me feel unlike I felt normally. I was living the fantasy that the road of excess led to the palace of wisdom. He was becoming Jim Morrison at this point. And all that bubbly, effervescent fun that I saw in the beginning was turning into like this dark, murky cauldron. And uh, Doug was, was disappearing into it. It was not as much a group effort. Doug was doing a lot of his vocals with Sharona and Mike Chapman, me and Burden would be sitting out there in the hallways pacing, and you know, Sharona would come out and go, hey guys, Doug nailed it. And me, me and Burden would go, so? Wait a minute, we don't work for the, we're in the band. Mike, I, and Sharona flew the Concord over to England to mix the album. We got enormous amount of cocaine and just laid it out, didn't bother chopping it up and tried to race one another, Mike and I, up the board. We were, uh, we were out of control. The tunes are new and different, but they're still Mac songs. You know, they're identifiable, they're filthy. I think when Doug and Burton brought Baby Talks Dirty in, the thing that maybe pissed everybody off more than anything was that the lyric was just over the top. I think this was Doug being a smart ass. Those lyrics for me were a little kind of slimy. You walk a fine line. If it's fun, Smitty, it's fun. You know, if you, if you tilt over into the other direction, then, then it's not so funny anymore. I still hated the lyric. Some girl saying, hurt me, hurt me. Ah, 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 you know? My baby likes a real nice beating. Come on! I have very strong opinions about that. I always felt if that song was on our fifth album, it would have been a number one hit. It was a real song, a true song, honest song. The lyrics were real. But the little girls understand sold well. However, in the huge shadow of their smash debut, it just couldn't compare. They had the sophomore jinx hard. You know, the second record, uh, you know, the little girls didn't understand, the critics didn't understand, no one understood. When you have a, a, a song and a group explode like the Knack did, the expectations are, are too high and overwhelming. The album was, by any stretch of a businessman's imagination, a huge success. I would love to have a failure that sells two and a half million copies. When the Knack headlined a sold out concert at the LA Forum, it was another indication that they had achieved another one of their dreams. There was a couple gigs where I actually got butterflies because of emotional context, you know, like when we played the Forum, where I had seen Jimi Hendrix and the Rolling Stones and, and the Los Angeles Lakers, and all of a sudden it was us on that stage. We played My Sharona and I played the solo. They bang, hit white lights on the hall. Literally everybody was on their feet with their arm like that, like, like somebody had told them to do it. And that was pretty damn exciting, because it is my hometown. The sweet taste of triumph didn't last long. Following the L.A. Forum show, the band's personal soap opera began to rapidly spiral out of control. We were out on tour for almost two and a half years and we recorded two albums during that period. It frazzled us. It frayed nerves and it made it impossible to think clearly. It's kind of rough being on the road sometimes, you know? But uh, it's nice to relax every now and then too, so excuse me. 
all the exhaustive touring and non-stop work for like two years did make it very hard for everybody to see straight. You need to take a break every once in a while. And we were worked to the bone. Bruce and Doug, even from the beginning, I think just had this knack of being able to set each other off. Bruce was uh, a little older, had more experience, and wasn't going to take that stuff. So he sort of fought against that control that Doug wanted to have, so that didn't help either. Hey, it's good. You can fucking see his fight yep. when you're at. The angst that we had between the two of us, I'm sure, helped a lot in our live shows. I guess we bounced off of each other before we hated each other. <laughs> and I think really Bruce at that time couldn't handle being put in a straitjacket creatively. And then Bruce would start to act out a little bit and then Doug would insist on getting his way. And then it would just be a mess. I was feeling like there was something rocking the boat all the time and it wasn't, it wasn't smooth sailing. There was conflicts, personal conflicts within this band that, that squelched the happiness that could have been derived from it. It was as much my fault as it was his. Um, had I been less chemically altered, I'm sure I would have been able to think things through a lot better than I was able to. We were successful because of Doug and in spite of Doug. And I don't mean that in any negative fashion. I think his talent and his, his, his group uh, concept and the fact that we all played off of each other was why we were successful. When it got to the other end of it, where he became more introverted, more that Jim Morrison type of, well, I'm here and you guys are there, that was the end of the band. We got word that the Knack were going to split up. And we still really, really believed in this band. We had a guy in our e &R department who was the founding drummer of Blood, Sweat and Tears, Bobby Columbi. Bobby had been through a lot of band drama on his own. He knew about these kinds of things. He got us all around a table in his office and said, you can't throw this away. It's the best thing that'll ever happen to you guys. And get a grip on yourselves. By then, I had really decided that I didn't want to work with Bruce anymore, but was convinced that perhaps I would just give it one more shot. I remember Round Trip being something that Doug wanted to take us from black and white into Technicolor. She likes the beat. You know, Round Trip was a much more eclectic album, and this was where we always wanted to go. We didn't want to keep doing albums that were of a kind. We love all kinds of music, and we wanted to start to show people that we could do all kinds of music. She likes the it was a chance to work with Jack Douglas, who I was always impressed with his work with uh, Aerosmith and Cheap Trick and others. It's not to mention doing Double Fantasy. It was the first album that he did after John died. So it was a bit of an honor and it was also uh, a difficult process for him because he was still mourning that loss. By 7.30 you'll be able to do the vocals. Oh, right. nice. She likes the beat. I was probably on a real self-destructive workaholic binge to escape from the horror that was John's assassination, his murder. This ain't a story, this ain't a movie show. This was going to be a huge, huge step forward for the band. They were not going to move forward one step. It was going to be two giant leaps. She likes the beat. There was a lot of pressure felt. I could feel it the whole time that this album had to do something if it didn't you know, Capital was ready to like, see you later. I think this is the first record we've really done that has the passion and the depth that everybody's kind of been waiting for, for us to give. It took us two and a half months to mix the album. It took um, one month to mix six songs. Mm -hmm. Two and a half months. How come? Uh, we just took a lot of time to get it exactly right. We needed time to rest, get our heads together, and now that we're doing this again, now with the third album, there is going to be some resistance because the last thing we did was not on the level of the first thing we did. So but we have the to, album but has. We're going to. Uh, this our third album is uh, 
a wonderful success in our own feeling about it. She's a runner around. She's a heavyweight champion cheese. Knack had always been way, way under budget. This was a case where it was rapidly becoming apparent that they were going to go over budget. And there was something else in the air that I was sensing, but it was very hard to get a handle on. It was pretty obvious that, that a lot of drugs were being done at this point in time. I didn't know which drugs. Cocaine was a good guess. I would be coked out of my head doing the record. You have to realize, though, that in the late 70s and early 80s, the labels thought Coke was like a gift from the gods because it kept everybody working, you know. In fact, it was always part of the recording budget. Oh, you know, the Coke, forget the Coke, had, you know, 5% to the budget. Nobody had any self-control at that time. It's like everybody's doing the designer drugs and overdoing the designer drugs for, for round-trip sessions. In many ways, uh, I look back on that as like walking into a sea of just insanity in those, in those sessions. The easiest way to come down from coke would be heroin. Of course, there wasn't much good China white out here in California. I'd have to have it sent from New York. And uh, I think Doug says, well, you know, Sometimes you go to the bathroom, you come back very happy, and it's not like you're doing coke. I mean, oh, man, I'm doing it like a blast of China White. So I turned Doug on to uh, doing heroin, and he was liking it. Doug had this enormous amount of insecurity, you know, about what he was doing, was this right? And I think the, you know, he medicated himself with the drugs, and it made him feel better. Doug was becoming more and more difficult. There was tension between the bandmates. They were burnt on each other, too. I think my luck's running out. Basically, Round Trip was the beginning of the end. Released in October 1981, Round Trip was greeted with the most positive reviews of the band's career. A round Trip is a record where uh, no matter where you drop the needle, the quality is all there, but uh, it's a different song. It, you know, there's a different vibe, a different, you know, it takes you on a little, it takes you on a round trip. <laughs> it's just got to be. You can't be sure till you open up the door. Open up the door. There wasn't an obvious hit single. Everybody kind of had a favorite song. We were stumped as to what single to go with. Bobby Columbia in our A&R department had a theory. He heard Pay the Devil and he said you could rework this and it could be a hit single. And We kind of looked at each other and went, okay, um, okay, you really want us to do this? And he said, yeah, yeah, this is what we should do. You got it made and you made it your way. Life's looking great. It eaten by the bay. I couldn't believe they chose it. It's a really good song, but it, it's just meant to be sitting back there where it is. You know, to put this out as the lead single, it was a, the wrong signal to give it for what this album was about. I think I knew in my heart that the album wasn't going to do anything um, business-wise. And so the fact that the song didn't click as a single certainly didn't surprise any of us. We went on a tour right after the album was released. At the end of that three-week tour, on New Year's Eve 1981, we broke up. We had lost favor in the business at that point. We weren't playing the forum anymore. We were reduced to playing medium-sized clubs. I've been there, man, and it's a fucking war. You know, to keep your band out there and like to keep the fans, you know, keep the customers satisfied, keep the fans happening, stay creative, keep your band from killing each other and themselves. We had a meeting with Capitol executives. Bruce had gotten up and sounded off on Doug about things he didn't like. I remember looking at Doug, kind of seeing the extent of what the last couple of years had done to him. I recently kicked heroin. Um, which was brutal. I was tired. I had to go on this three-week tour. He was in scary shape. I mean, he was really in a bad way. 
uh, I, it was painful to be in a room with him. It really was. It was such a self-destructive time in his life and kind of taking us with him, you know. <laughs> I stood up and I said, I'm sorry, I've had it. I can't work with this person anymore, and I really have to leave. Doug said he wasn't going to do the band with Bruce, and so I chose to move on with Bruce and Prescott. Had we not broken up, I would not be sitting here. There's no question in my mind that I would be dead. I would have been one of those casualties. My relationship with Sharona ended about six months after the band broke up. We had burned so hot, it had just burned up. I really had to make changes in my life for me to quit drinking, quit using drugs. Doug showed up at my door one day, and I hadn't talked to him in a long time, and I seemed in really good shape. That just lifted such a dark cloud from the whole aspect of being with him. I mean, it really was all about what he had been doing to himself that the idea of starting a partnership up again uh, was, was a good one. The Knack reunited in 1986, but soon personal and creative differences led to Bruce Gary once again splitting from the group. Released in 1991, the band's fourth record, Serious Fun, yielded a top 10 FM radio hit, Rocket of Love. Serious Fun was our heavy metal record. Again, we were going to take the band, a little quantum leap, and move it from the psychedelic era to that heavy metal era. Eight years later, Zoom, featuring acclaimed drummer Terry Bozio, rocketed into stores. Zoom has a lot of stuff that I can turn to and say that's what the Knack does best. Zoom, I think, is the best album that the Knack ever recorded. It's my favorite album, song-wise. In 2001, the album Normal is the Next Guy kept the Knack's legacy alive and rocking in the 21st century. Normal is the Next Guy is our white album in that every song is different from every other song. It's very eclectic. If Smells Like Teen Spirit was the gateway to the 90s, My Sharona was the gateway to the 80s. I think The, the Knack is one of the greatest bands of all time. Live, they're incredible. Uh, their albums are amazing. Well, how many people can say that they were able to make millions of people happy, even for a moment in their lifetimes? I couldn't be more proud and pleased about that. So that's the biggest payoff for me. Every once in a while, somebody will say something like, you're the reason I learned to play guitar. How many people in their lifetimes will have a perfect stranger walked up to them and say, you had an impact on my life for the better. Songs hold up, and I really could give a damn what the critics have to say now, then, uh, you know, or in the future. Truthfully, it's about the songs, and Doug Figer can write them, the Knack can play them, and that really is the ultimate vindication. Uh, no one is reading reviews from the 70s, uh, but people are still listening to Get the Knack. The only thing I know is I'm still looking for my tie. I mean, it started out this way, it's, it's, it's going on this way. Oh, I can't find my tie. Oh, it's all right. Oh, oh. You squeeze my heart when you let it go. My oh my, I can't have fallen, no I wouldn't try I can't explain, no I don't know how And all my talking is nothing now It only frightens you anyhow You never know what you've done to me The agony and the ecstasy Ooh Tara, it's alright But I miss you tonight Oh, Tara, oh, 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 squeeze my heart when you let it go. Oh, 
Yeah, Sharona. Hey, how are you? I'm so happy you called. It's perfect timing. I just got a message from the realtor and we can see the house before it even comes on the market. 